All right, here we go. One of my heroes is in the building. Ken Shamrock, former UFC champion, WWF Intercontinental Champion, WWF World Tag Team Champion, the world's most dangerous man. Welcome to Vlad TV. Ah, oh, man, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I appreciate your support, brother. <laughs> oh, man, long time, long time supporter from UFC 1, actually. Oh, back when it was like, literally, no rules? <laughs> you oh, kick oh, a guy yeah. when they're down, oh, you yeah. know, everything. Oh, yeah. I actually, I remember I got the VHS tape at Blockbuster. That's how I watched it. I didn't yeah, get the pay-per-view. The only way you could get it was going to the adult section. <laughs> right, pretty much. Yeah, I think it was mixed in there, right? <laughs> they wouldn't let it out on the shelves because it was too violent, I guess. <laughs> yep, yep, uh, yep. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you were actually born on an Air Force base. Yes, in Warner Robins. Yes. Okay. And, um, well, your mom uh, was actually a waitress and a dancer. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, you know, especially back in them days, you know, a go-go dance. It was, you know, I guess you can kind of put it towards a, you know, stripper kind of back in those days. And she had three kids. Uh, we were just a year apart, very young, five, six, seven years old. She was trying to raise us, support us. And she was probably only 17 when she had her first kid. Uh, I was 19 or 20 uh, when I was there and I was a kid. Um, probably 24 um, when things started to get out of control where we were running around pretty much on our own all the time and she was still trying to work no support so yeah it was it was a it was a rough start okay and i guess your dad left the family when you were four yeah i i don't i i couldn't tell you uh because i don't remember him but i did meet up with him when i was uh 45 years old i believe i got to finally meet him because my second oldest brother uh, actually hunted him down later in life and just got to meet him. And, and he had recently in the last two years passed away, but I got to meet him. And uh, so it was, you know, after you hear stories from both sides, you know, it, it's, you know, it's always one sided when one person's telling it. So, uh, so I, I kind of, I kind of got where he was coming from. So we got to mend it, but I already had a father. And so I just made it really clear to him that, you know, things, this is how things worked out and, and they're not changing. And so he was okay with it. Well, after your biological dad left, your mom got remarried, right? Yep. And then you guys moved to Napa. Oh yeah. <laughs> from Georgia, from, from Southern Georgia to the, to this middle-class area where we were in the ghetto. Uh, it was, it was a shocker because Everybody looked different, right? I mean, I was in pretty much a predominantly African-American neighborhood. We were in the ghetto, uh, fighting all the time. But that was my world. That's what I lived in. That's what I was used to. Then we move away at a young age. And now all of a sudden, in this middle-class area, we got our own beds, you know. We got a nice house. We got food. We got toys. You know, everything seems to be good except for the culture. We just weren't used to it. And we were, we were pretty violent. So needless to say, because we were different, um, being that young and, and a kid at that age, when someone, at least uh, kind of kids we were, if somebody started to make fun of you, you just, you just beat them up. And so that didn't go well <laughs> in, uh, in school. And I got suspended quite a bit, got in lots of trouble, hung out with the wrong crowd, and then eventually ended up in, I uh, got stabbed uh, at 10 years old, ended up in juvenile hall. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. So you ran away from home when you were 10, right? Yes. Yeah, well, actually I ran away about nine or my first time running away, I was a little bit younger, but it was kind of just running away for the day. But when I really ran away at 10 years old, and I was living out of a car. That was at 10. Okay. And you got stabbed during that time. Yeah. Well, actually at 13 years old, I think it was 13. No, actually it was 10. Yeah, it was 10 because I got placed at 13 uh, at the Shamrock Boys Home. So it was 10 years old. I got stabbed. I got locked up. I went into placement. Um, my very first time going to placement, I was 10. Um, I ended up going through several group homes over the three-year span ended up at the shamrock boys home at the age of 13 um and and that's when i started to see a little bit of light okay so you end up settling at the the bob shamrock uh group home yes boys home okay and you guys got so close you actually changed your last name to shamrock yeah it was uh 
Yeah, it was kind of one of those things that grew into that because when I got there, obviously with the way that I was raised, um, I was fighting all the time. Even when I got to the group home, I think it wasn't more than a day or two I was in a fight. Um, there was 18 boys in the home, sometimes 22 boys. It was a big house. It was a mansion. It was beautiful. It wasn't what I was used to. Um, and it took uh, at least a year, year and a half for me to trust anybody because at a young age, um, I was taken advantage of by many, many different situations. My brothers too, because we were with people that were from that night area and that, that you know, bad bad, uh, just bad people. Right. And so we were, we were exposed to a lot of bad things. So going to a home where you're in this mansion and this, this guy's being nice to you, it was, nobody's nice to you unless they want something. And so it took a long, long time for me to really trust anyone. And I remember he was always trying to hug me because that's what he did to every boy there. He would discipline him. Then he would hug him. And the only time I ever got hugged is if somebody was trying to take advantage of you. And so for me, it was like, don't touch me, don't touch me. And so it was probably, I would say, a year, year and a half before I really started to let go and really start to care for someone, like literally have somebody care for me and me care for them. And uh, so that's when I really believed that, um, and, and, it, and it all came through sports. It was because I was successful at sports. I was able to give away from the bad crowd because I, I started to become important. I became relevant because I was good at football, because I was good at wrestling. And because I was good at that stuff, people wanted to help me get good grades because I was in special ed, because I didn't have an education. I didn't go to school when I was a kid. The first time I actually went to a school on a regular basis was my freshman year. And so I went in there behind and I had to go into special ed. And of course, that caused fights because kids would kind of make fun. And it was like, hey, wrong dude. <laughs> Don't make fun of this one. Uh, but again, like I said, all those things that played a role into me being able to turn the corner and start looking at life differently. Well, you were in seven different group homes by the time you got to the, the, the Shamrock Boys home. Uh, yes. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, there was enough, I, it's a while back, but yeah, it was probably five, 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 four or five, probably I would think. Okay. And you talked about how you were scared to hug people because they wanted something out of you. Was there some level of abuse that was happening in those homes? Because I've heard some horror stories from people that went through a system like that. Oh, you, you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't kidding. I mean, that is a breeding ground for um, people to take advantage of the power because, you know, those kids are one, when you're that, that kid, you're, you're lost and you're needy and you're looking for someone to care for you. And so it's just a vulnerable place to be. So you got all these house parents coming in who are working in these homes that see these things that have those kind of backgrounds. Um, obviously they do background checks, but you know, it slips through the cracks. People get in there. And so it's a breeding ground for that stuff. That stuff didn't happen to me in the group home, right? Uh, more of that stuff was when my mother would get babysitters to come over or different things that would, would happen within that world that she was working in. Um, that's where those issues came in, which which really guarded me when I went into the group homes because then I knew what the, I knew what it looked like. I knew what those people and the and the vibe those people put off looked like. So I was always defensive uh, in that stuff. And even though Bob Shamrock was putting out that vibe of caring, for me it looked the same thing as someone wanting to take advantage of you. But it wasn't. And unfortunately, fortunately for me, I stayed there long enough to see the real Bob Shamrock. Okay. Did someone actually do something to you during that time? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just one time I was in a bathroom when I was left in there. You know, somebody wanted, some dude came in there and like I said, it was very vague, very spotty. I don't remember a lot of it, but I do know it's one of those things that you don't want to remember. And then another one was we were left. And most people, people look at this and they think, wow, I wish I could have done that. You know, well, that's not anything. It was, you know, because it was the opposite sex. It was like we were left there with, so I believe it was a teenage girl. I was five years old at the time. And there was sexual content that happened. And it, was, it wasn't like it was forced on us, but we were put in that situation where... It happened, and it was like I'm five years. I don't even know what to do with it, right? But, but it it 
it did something to me in that respect manner, in that fact of, of what it's like to, how to treat a woman, me as a kid growing up. Uh, because of that situation, um, I didn't respect women for a long time. And so as I would be dating as a younger kid, they meant nothing to me. They were there for one thing and one thing only. And so that's a bad, that's a bad start in life. But because of what happened and, and the way I felt about that, I was angry. So I had to go through a lot of recovery in order for me to be able to understand how life works. Okay, so eventually you have a stable household and you're going to Lassen High School? Sorry that? Uh, was it uh, Lassen High School? Yeah, Lassen, yes, Lassen High School, yes. Okay, so you're going to Lassen High School and you're doing well in football and wrestling. Yes. And actually you were going to go to the state championships in wrestling, but you ended up breaking your neck right before the competition? Yeah, that was uh, uh, my, my senior year, one month, uh, away from my uh, birthday um, and we're going into practice. Um, I was undefeated and I was going in there and normally freshmen come in and they tape the mats and they clean them and we start practice. Season's over. Like this is going into sections and state. And so um, we had to go in and they, I know the guys that came in, there's a few guys that were coming in practice. The coach was there. So they pushed the mats together and they cleaned it, but they didn't tape them. And there was air underneath the mats, which, Nobody saw it at the time, but there was some air underneath it, which makes it slide a little bit easier when you shoot. And so um, I was in there wrestling and I was messing around, picking a guy up. And this I wrestled heavy. Like I wrestled up two weight classes, 185 and I weighed 160, 167. And I wrestled 185 because I was just so strong and fast. And I'd outwork heavyweights. And so I'd go in there and I had this bigger guy in there. And I remember just playing around and tapping and this and that and Coach said, you better take them down. You're going to do walls. And that's a conditioning drill. And I hated conditioning. I was a pretty good athlete. I had great condition. I hated working at it, though. And uh, so I remember shooting in on him. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground. And I'm just laying there. And uh, Coach saying, get up. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting up. That's what I'm thinking in my head. You know, okay, get up. And I'm not moving. And I'm thinking to myself, get up. And I just, I, like, I feel like I've got no power. Like, I'm helpless. And uh, I feel sharp pain going down my arm. Like, and I'm thinking to myself, why can't I move? I can feel the pain, <laughs> but I can't, I can't move. It's like I'm numb. And um, probably about 10 seconds ago, it felt like longer than that, but it was about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you start to panic. Everybody's like, now they're like, uh, you okay? And I'm like, I, I can't move. So it was probably about 45 minutes to an hour later, there's an ambulance there. And they scooped me up. They put me in there, clamped it down. That was from the time it happened till the time they picked me up. It was about that much time. Clamped me down, picked me up, put me in the ambulance. Took me two and a half hours away to a place called Redding, California. Um, and that's where a specialist was at. Okay. The first of many injuries over the course of your life. Oh, we, I broke my neck actually twice. One of them, I just fractured. It wasn't completely broken. That was while I was fighting. And I had it refixed and got brackets put in instead of the fusion. Um, but the first time when I broke it, yeah, that was, it was my really first major injury, 17. Right, right. Okay, so you graduate high school, and a couple of years later, you joined the UWF, the Japanese Universal Wrestling Federation. That was, uh, that was, that was, that was one of those things where you just kind of, I, I kind of walked into it because a friend actually introduced me to it. I watched a videotape. I saw these two guys going, I've never seen this before. Like they were like open hand striking, knee kicking, taking people down, suplexing them, going into these different little moves like submission holds. And I was looked at it and I immediately got just jacked up because I remember thinking, man, that's what I, that's what I was doing on the street. Right. I mean, I was really just going and fighting people, but this was so skilled. Like these guys, when they were on the ground, they were able to put people to sleep and do all these joint locks and, I was like, dude, how do I do that? And and I remember it was Dean Malenko who actually introduced me to it. And I said, dude, how do I get into that? And he said, man, my dad trains fighters up in Florida. And I said, man, can you ask him see if I can get in it? And he says, you want to do that? And he says, man, that ain't no joke. And I said, man, I want to do that. And he goes, okay. So he sent me up there to, to Florida and I did a tryout. And they had a bunch of foreigners up there that were going over there. And I went through all of them just by natural wrestling and boxing skills and street stuff. 
went through them pretty easily. Well, then they sent me to Japan for a tryout. And when I got the call, I was like, I'm going to Japan, man. Like, I went from Georgia to, to California. I thought that was big. Now I'm going to Japan. And uh, so I get on a plane. I get there. Uh, long flight. I mean, 12, 11, 12 hours. We get off the plane. They pick me up, take me to this dojo. I didn't even get to go to the hotel. They just took me right from the plane to the dojo. I walk in the dojo and they say, get dressed. <laughs> I like, got my luggage and I was like, okay. I put all this stuff on and uh, they, I get on the mat and they sent two guys in there and I'm like, oh, let's go. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to be tough. So I go and I first, wrestle the first one. And I pretty much dominate him, right? Just, just destroy him. Another guy comes in. It was about 20, 25 minutes. I get another one. Oh, I get him. I put him down. I'm, I'm controlling just my wrestling and stuff. And I'm feeling pretty good. Like, I can do this. Well, what I didn't know was the two guys that they put in there to wrestle with me were, they were young boys. <laughs> they weren't fighters. And I was thinking to myself, that I, and as media as I started to get confident, um, Funaki and Suzuki, the guys that I saw on that videotape, walked in, in the door. And I remember looking at them, like, oh, they look familiar. And then I started to go, that was the, those are the two guys. And so um, I hear those guys talking to them and they start getting dressed. And then Sammy, who was the one that actually brought me over there, um, who was a Japanese promoter, said, uh, you go a little bit more? And I said, yeah, I can go all day, you know, cocky. So he says, okay. So he brings out Suzuki first. Suzuki's a small one. He goes about 180 pounds, about 5'9". And um, so I get into with him and I'm feeling pretty good, right? And so I shoot in, I start working with him and he gets my back. He sits out, spins around. Next thing he's got my back, I'm fighting it. And then all of a sudden, I don't remember anything. <laughs> I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, what happened? Like, I'd never been choked out before. Like, I didn't know what happened. And uh, Sammy goes, oh, it's okay. Uh, you, you got choked. I was like, Okay. He goes, can you go keep going? I said, yeah, I can keep going. I was getting a little discouraged. So I, we went a little bit longer. And again, we went for another 20, 25 minutes and he just destroyed me. I've never had anybody. And I was stronger than him. I was in better shape than him, or at least I felt like I was, but he just outworked me. He spun around. He put me in ankle locks, arm bars, stuff I had never seen before. And uh, so I got done with him and I was just frustrated. I was like, man, no one's ever handled me like that before. And so I remember Sammy looked at me and says, hey, you go, you want to go again? Go some more. And I've gone for a while now. And I was like, I was like, I got to make up for this. And I said, yeah, I, I, let's go some more. So he brings in Fanaki. Now Fanaki goes about six one, six foot six one, And he's about 220. And so he comes in and I'm already in my mind going, if he's anything like Suzuki, I'm in trouble. And uh, he was better than Suzuki. So <laughs> needless to say, it was about 20, 25 minutes. I just got smashed. But what I, what I didn't realize was they were looking for the determination, the I will not quit, the desire to keep going. And that's what I used my whole time in training Lions Den fighters wasn't the ability to actually win a fight. It was the ability to put them in. So they were so tired that when they went in to fight, they had to have nothing but desire and heart to continue to keep fighting. And if I have that, I can train you. Okay, so you get through this, and the UWF ended up folding. And to replace it came the Pancreas Hybrid Wrestling Federation. And uh, that's when you actually got to uh, fight Funaki. Yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting. So um, <laughs> here I was, I did my first fight, and, and here's a, uh, man... I, I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I mean, remember the kid I was and where I came from. Now I'm in Japan. And my first experience in front of a crowd was in front of 17,000 people. I went to this new organization. Here I am fighting in front of all these people. And uh, I ended up getting the win and uh, got my hand raised. And then I got Fanaki after that. And we went 40 six minutes in my second match uh, ever uh, in a fight with Fanaki. And that right there, man, I can remember like that was yesterday. Okay. So you get through that. And then that's when UFC won that same year as when they launched. And I remember, like I said in the beginning of the interview, I used to rent these UFC tapes from Blockbuster or whatever video store I happened to live by at the time. And it was 
absolute insanity. And I remember the thing that really struck, you know, struck out, you know, in that first UFC one was there was no weight classes. So you had that one dude that was like 400 pounds fighting, fighting this dude that looked like about 170. Remember that? Gerard Godot against Emmanuel Tue. Two, two. There you go. Yeah, the sumo guy that weighed almost 500 pounds or something like that, man. Yeah, that was insane. And you could kick people in the face while they're down. <laughs> I think he knocked one of his teeth out. <laughs> and I think that was the fight when you saw that, when you were you know ready to fight yourself. You're like, oh, okay, this is real. This is a little different than what I'm used to. Well, you got to remember, this was in, what, in, in 93. And yeah. here I'm being told after I'm in Japan, I'm a champion over there. I've done a lot within a, in a year and a half, two years. Uh, and I feel like this is extreme. Like we're kicking and throwing it to the ground, doing something. I'm thinking this is extreme. And then I, I hear this thing, <laughs> the UFC, like no holes barred, anything goes. And I was like, because one of my students actually brought me a flyer when uh, when we were training. Say, hey, this is no holds barred, anything goes. And I was like, oh man, throw that away. It's wrestling. And he goes, no, it's not. It's real. And I like, so I looked at it and it was talking about how it was going to chug style against style, you know, karate against boxer, who would win. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, let me check it out. But in 93, man, come on. We had sanctions. We had rules. I mean, it, it, it just didn't, you couldn't, nowhere in a gym could you do this. Like you couldn't, in a boxing ring, you couldn't go in there and take somebody to the ground. They kick you out or vice versa, go in a wrestling place and punch at somebody. It just, it just wasn't possible. So when they came up with this, and I remember talking to Art Davies on the phone and asking him, is this real? He basically said, no, this is real. And uh, so I remember going all the way into the very first fight uh, with my mind going, is this really going to happen? And we go right back to that fight with uh, 2A and Gerard Godot. There is absolutely no fight that could have been first to make it any better because if it was me or Hoist, people would have booed and thought it was fake. But because it was that football kick from 60 yards, put his teeth into the front row, it was like, how do you deny this is not real? I mean, like this set the tone for what we were going to see today. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So you're fighting UFC one. You end up beating Patrick Smith. And then you end up fighting Hoist Gracie. Yeah, the guy in the pajamas. <laughs> right, right. He showed up in his karate outfit and you were, you know, he wasn't very big. He wasn't very muscular. no. no. He was so small. all of us, I remember watching this yeah. and I was like, okay, this guy doesn't look very impressive. We don't see this going very far. None of us really knew about uh, Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu at the time. And you guys ended up fighting and what happened? Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. Let me tell you a story on that too because when I first got in there, I was sizing everybody up and Hoist was walking around in his gate. And I was thinking to myself, man, this guy looks like he's walking around in his pajamas, you know? It was almost like you couldn't take him serious. And he looked like a boy. I mean, he looked like a teenage boy. Uh, and he was and he was small. And, uh, you know, I think I went 190, 195 at the time. And I think he was 170, 180, something like that. And I'm thinking to myself, I thought that Gerard Godot was the one that made it to the finals because I knew him from Japan and K1. I figured that's who I would be fighting in the finals because he's in the other bracket. And so I kind of, kind of put it past. I thought Patrick Smith would be tough because he won a Sabaki challenge or something like that. So when I put Pat away, I figured I'd go in against Hoist. And I mean, I literally, my mind was like, why is he here? Like, really? It's like, this is not a good space for him. And so when we get in there and I remember shooting on him and I hook him and I go to throw him down and he rolls through and I'm in a side control. And the next thing I feel is something across my neck. And I'm like, okay. No one can choke me. I mean, I've been in this position before. I just pull their arm off. So I reach up to go ahead and just yank the arm off because he's not big. He can't be strong. So I go to reach it up and there's no arm or there's arm, but there's material in between. And I can't get the, I can't pull it off. And then I, I remember tapping. And then after I tapped, I look up and I go, I just tapped. I, I just tapped. And I remember thinking to myself, how did I get choked? And I, I remember it's like, I never, I never understood until that day what that gi did. I mean, that literally eliminated any power, any strength I had over him. Once he had it around my neck, I was not getting it off. And so for me, I think that was, and I actually, I was talking with Hoyson a couple nights ago. And uh, I remember saying to him, that was the one instant where it forced me to wake up and train harder and start being more, um, I guess, more 
towards my craft and figuring out more disciplines rather than staying in one thing. Because when we were in Japan, we just did the Pankers style and I wasn't looking outside of that, but there was a whole other world out there besides what I was doing because I thought that was it. So it really opened up my eyes to really train better, become a better, better fighter and, and train better at different crafts and learn more things rather than being focused on one thing. Well, 1994, UFC 3, there was supposed to be the rematch between you and Hoist Gracie. So you go into it, you end up beating uh, Christoph Leninger, and you also beat Felix Mitchell, but Hoist Gracie ends up dropping out of the tournament. That was disappointing because, you know, in the UFC, and especially being bare knuckle and you fight multiple fights, you're going to have injuries. You're going to have things wrong with you. I fought through them. Every time that I went into a fight, I've always fought through them. You're there unless something's broke, right? And then you can't really compete because you're going to make it worse and ruin your career. But if it's just like being tired or cramping up or, you know, a little here and there, you fight through it, right? You just go. And so I remember I was fighting uh, Felix and I remember twisting my knee and sprained. I remember walking out limping uh, after I had fought him. Um, but I was willing to go because it was nothing torn. It was just sore. And I remember being fatigued too, because it was two fights. And so I was, I was waiting and I was, I remember this was revenge for me. And, um, because I took hoist lightly the first time, I wasn't going to do it a second time. And so, uh, hoist goes into his, his match and I don't understand it to this day. Um, and he's never explained it to me or, or even talked to me about it, but he walks into the ring, into the into the octagon. One, we have an alternate. That's what they're there for. And throws in the towel. And I kept thinking to myself, why would you do that and not allow an alternate to step in and be able to compete when you know you're not going to fight? That's what they're there for. And the only thought I could come up with was he wanted me to have a disadvantage going into the finals where the other guy would be fresher because he wouldn't have to fight anybody going into the finals. And so when he dropped out, my focus because of that night, remember I was a champion in Japan and I was, I was, I mean, I was beating everybody. I mean, I was on top of the world until I got beat. And so my focus was directly at hoist. I didn't want anybody else. I didn't care to fight anybody else. So when he dropped out of that tournament, I said, I, and, and I believe this 100%, if I don't do that and I go in there and I fight and I win that tournament, I probably don't get the chance to fight Hoist. I probably don't get a chance to do that. But because I stepped out of that tournament and everybody asked why, and I said, because I didn't come here to fight anybody else but Hoist Gracie. That put the spotlight on me and Gracie. I would won both of my fights, so it wasn't like I lost and wanted to fight. I won both of them. And I could have walked through that. And I think anybody and myself knows that would not have been a fight for me. And I know that. But that's not what I was there for. I was there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to fight Hoist Gracie. Okay. And then in 1995, UFC 5, you got to fight Hoist Gracie for the third time. And this time it ends up being just a draw. Yeah. <laughs> so they say, right? That's the rules. But yes, it was. And, and that was the rules um, because they had put a time limit in. And it was the first time they ever... That was the first time limit ever. Like before, it was all fight until somebody loses. And this had nothing to do with Hoist. At nothing at all. This had to do with the timing of pay-per-view. Uh, the blocks were going longer. And they. I guess the fight before that, it went longer than it was supposed to. And, uh, you know, people lost pay-per-view and people were mad. And so they came in with this thing about being having blocks and where you've got to have so much time. And so they came in and actually announced the time limit. The only problem with that was I'm not sure why they waited to tell me the day before the fight <laughs> because it was a huge disadvantage for me not knowing that there was a 30-minute time limit because then I would have been able to train a little bit differently and more explosive uh, because I knew that there was a time limit and I could go harder uh, after him because I knew that 30 minutes, there was a time. It wasn't forever. And if I don't finish him, I'm not going to gas out. And so I trained for a three-hour fight. And I would be in the gym and I would be going with a guy every five minutes, there would be a fresh guy coming in and I would go for two hours and just get my conditioning up. So is that when I went in against Hoist, 
I was not going to gas and I could push him where I wanted him to go, wear him out and then beat him at his own game. And it was, and that's hard to do because he had 25 years of experience on me. He had, I only had two years in this and he was 25 years with 50 years of his family behind doing exactly what they were doing. Um, and it was a promotion for Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which was intelligent. I mean, in, incredibly intelligent for them to do that. But I knew what it was, right? And I knew I was at a disadvantage when it came to this style. So I had to go in there and make sure that I was in com great conditioning and push him past his conditioning. And I did just that. The only problem is they put the time limit in there and I wasn't able to fulfill what my training and what I was doing to go out there to defeat him. But I felt like I showed well enough um, to really put myself uh, as the number one fighter in the world, which I did, which after that fight, I was ranked uh, the number one fighter in the world after that. So, but yeah, so that was another kind of little kink in the Hoist Gracie and Ken Shamrock trilogy. <laughs> okay. And uh, Dan Severn ended up winning UFC five. So then in UFC six, you got to fight Dan Severn. And uh, before the fight actually happened, there was a bunch of drama during the press conference. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I I forget her name, but she was managing him. And we go into this press conference, Dan Severn and myself, and I'm a, I'm pretty vocal, you know, and I like to talk. I like to be able to promote a fight. I like to, you know, keep things excited. And Severn's kind of a, you know, low key kind of guy, right? He says things and he's just direct. Um, and so... We were in there and, and of course I was being me. I was promoting the fight and, uh, you know, saying things to, to get attention and kind of get in under his skin a little bit. And um, he's just sitting there, right? And uh, so about 10 minutes into the interview, he gets up and walks out. And I'm like, that was rude. Like, what's wrong with him? And 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 I forget his, like I said, I forget her name, but his, she gets up and walks by and says, he's going to destroy you. I mean, she was more aggressive than he was. So it was like, at least we got something out of him, right? And I looked up and I said, you know what? I was going to beat him, but now I'm going to hurt him. <laughs> so, and he walked out and later on, I find out it was because he just felt like uh, they weren't giving him the attention. They were always asking me questions. They were talking to me. And I remember telling him like, dude, it's because, you know, when you, when somebody asks you a question, it's a one word answer. It's like, there's no content. And so I was the one that was always kind of giving him more, kind of building the fight. And Severn was just like straightforward, one answer. And uh, so, and, I, and that's why they were doing it. It wasn't like they were disrespecting him. They were just kind of, they were there trying to build a fight just like me. Okay, well, the fight ended up happening and uh, you ended up uh, making him tap out uh, two minutes and 14 seconds in. Yeah, it was... It was, it was kind of disrespectful. I felt I was being disrespected because here I just went in with Hoist and did what I did with Hoist um, and my, my, my career prior to that and things that I had done. Uh, here I was probably at the time, uh, probably the number one ranked fighter in the world. Severin just won, I believe it was two Ultimate Ultimates or maybe it was one at the time. I don't remember. That was one because I fought him after he won the second one. So he comes in and he's listed as the champion. And I'm listed as a shoe fighting champion. And I'm like, what happened here? <laughs> so I felt really, really disrespected, not only about the press conference, by how, how people were reacting of like Severn was going to beat me. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, logically, like, okay, what has he got over me? Okay, he's 260 pounds. I'm 220, 215. Okay, so he's bigger than me. He's not faster than me. Uh, I, I don't believe he's strong in me, but maybe he would just call it even. Um, he can out wrestle me, but he can't out submit me. He can't out strike me and he can't out quarter me and he's not faster than me. Somebody tell me what I'm missing here. And so in my head, I'm thinking he, he can't beat me. Like, what is he going to wrestle me to a draw? Um, I'm like, I just don't see it. And so I, I went in there pretty determined to finish him. And so, and I had different things that I'd worked on because he was a wrestler. He would shoot in with his head and he did. And I caught him once and he was able to get out of it. And I was like, oh, cause I thought that was my chance to finish it fast, catch him off guard. Cause I knew he'd do it, but I didn't think he would do it again. I thought, okay, now I'm going to have to really work. It's going to go deeper into the fight. I'm going to have to 
put him in positions to be able to beat him. Uh, but he did it again. And not only did it again, he pushed me up against the fence and actually gave me a brace. So I could like to stand there and hold it. And uh, I ended up finishing me tapped out. And, uh, but after that fight was over and all that stuff that happened, man, we were good. Okay. So then UFC 7 rolls around where you actually got to fight uh, Oleg Taktorov, a.k.a. the Russian Bear, a name that's I've been called before as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is actually a friend of yours. Uh, he trained at Lions Den as well, and you didn't actually want to hurt him. And ultimately, this ended up in a draw. Yeah, actually, it was it was also a business uh, decision because he was actually under contract with me to fight over in Pancras. Um, and so I knew if I was able to get a leg lock on him, which in training, I worked with him and I knew what I could do. I mean, we, we worked out and I beat him up pretty good, right? Like I did in the fight, but even with submissions. And the thing I knew about him was that he wouldn't tap. And uh, it would either probably break his ankle or his knee, and then he'd be out. And so for me, it was really about going in and just dominating the fight, winning the fight, um, and trying to knock him out. Because I real I knew after a knockout, he could come back a month later and fight. It would be fine. Um, and so as you seen in there, I never went for a submission. I was always about trying to, to put him away with punches. But again, he has a chin. And I think I, I, I probably would have better off tried to submit him because the next morning when he woke up, I, I kid you not, his eyes were swollen shut. Uh, it was bad. And so I didn't realize the, the amount of damage that was happening to him, even though I was the one doing it. I didn't realize how bad it was until that next day. Well, then UFC 8 rolls around. You end up beating uh, Kimo Leopoldo. And then UFC 9 was the rematch with Dan Severn. But before the match actually happened, uh, the city didn't actually want the fight in the city and try to shut down the entire event. So they ended up changing the rules right before the match. Yeah, it was chaos because everywhere we were going, uh, we were having problems being able to put fights on because it was a political fight going on every time we went to a city. So they were spending a lot of money trying to keep things right. But me and Severin got there and it was going to be a, another one of those fights. And I, because I had, and Severin too, I found out later on too, Severin had issues too before this fight. So we were both handicapped. And, uh, but I had had a meniscus tear, which is not anything that's detrimental because it's just a tissue in your knee that clicks and catches, but it's painful. It's, 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 it's difficult to shoot without a lot of pain. So I had that going on and then I had a cracked rib. Um, so my whole point was, was that I was going to, you know, knock Severn out. I felt like I had hands. I have good defense to a takedown. My whole strategy was to go in there and knock him out. So we get to the fight and of course, we know there's always something happening of trying to close the thing down, right? But they always win and we, we do the fight. Well, it wasn't but a, a, a two weeks prior to that, they had this fight over in, in, in Canada, just over the bridge. And they did a fight and they were told the same thing, right? No punching. Like, you can't punch. It's like, what? Like, this is not a grappling tournament. This is an MMA. It's like, how do you do this without not punching, you know? And so, but the guys did it. And so a couple of them got arrested over, over in Canada because they did it anyways. Well, and this was in Canada, not Detroit. So we were good. We thought. So they come to us and they tell us, hey, you guys can't, they're, they're saying that we can't punch unless we wear gloves. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not happening. Um, and so they said that, uh, you know, you guys could go in there and, you, you know, you guys kind of do what you're going to do. And that if you punch somebody, the referee's going to warn you and he's going to warn you, oh, he won't disqualify you. He won't take any points. He's just going to keep warning you and that uh, we are going to fine you and collect the payment <laughs> whenever needed, <laughs> you know, like whenever we decide to. So a lot of stuff was talked about and, and they weren't going to do anything. They were going to let you punch. I had a group home for kids. I was teaching kids that they could, from my experience, that you could do whatever you want in life as long as you stay within the rules. And so now I'm being told that we have an organization backing you on breaking the rules. 
but the actual law itself isn't going to be behind the organization. The organization's not going to get arrested. I'm going to get arrested and it's going to be all over and I'll lose my license for having this group home where I'm trying to help at-risk kids. So I had a lot weighing on me and I was like, I, I was going to, I was backing out of the fight. I was going to not fight because first of all, I already knew I had some, some things that were hindering me. I was going to do the fight anyways, because I felt like I could still win the fight. But when they took away the striking, it literally left me with nothing. Like I, I, I couldn't roll. I mean, it was too painful. So I thought to myself, I'm not going to fight. Well, then my dad comes to me and said, dude, they, they sold this place out. They're going to re reimburse the tickets, you know, and so the whole organization came into my room and they were all telling me, dude, we got, we got to fight. It's like, I mean, basically pressure. So I did the fight. Severin had the same issues. I mean, like he, he had issues going on with him and I, he, he could speak for himself, but he wasn't a hundred percent. And so we went into this fight. We went into this fight, first of all, not being able to do what we want to do fully. And two, we were limited on it in what we can do. Like, for instance, they wouldn't let you punch. But if you do, in the back of our mind, we're going, we're going to go home? <laughs> like, we're going to get out of here? Um, so it was, but that, again, these are things in the end, towards the end of the UFC, that Bob Meyerowitz uh, and the UFC were dealing with constantly when we were going to every city. Okay. And that ended up with a loss for you. It was a split decision. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, let me, let me talk about it. that was the worst UFC fight in the history. I'm including to this date. <laughs> it's the absolute worst fight by any two individuals in UFC history. Right. You said it was the, the biggest regret of your fighting career. No, oh, it was huge because I, you know, I, I should have stood on my, on my, on what I believed in. I should have stood my ground and said, you know, no, I'm not doing it because I, I cheated the fans. They didn't get to see a fight. They got to see two guys out there dancing. <laughs> After that, you were in the UFC ultimate ultimate where you beat Brian Johnston. But right around that time, Senator John McCain was basically lobbying to take pay-per-view UFC off the cable broadcasts and TCI cable ended up pulling it. So that ended up hurting the overall money situation. So basically you're having less money, you're getting burnt out. And that's when you actually decided to leave MMA and go to professional wrestling. Yeah. It came down to a conversation with Bob Meyerowitz. It was a cordial conversation, but I was, I, I my contract was up. You know, I left the Pankers organization. I fully focused on UFC. I wanted to be the face of that organization. And I was, uh, and uh, I was guaranteed a certain amount of money and I got that money. And then it was a, another guarantee after that, um, year was up that I would get more depending on what had happened. Well, I reached my goals, uh, and I was guaranteed that money. And, um, they came to me and said they couldn't pay me. And, uh, I understood it, man, cause I knew what they were going through, but, they were asking if I would take a cut. And I told them, I said, you know, in, in any other case, I would do it. But in this circumstance, I can't support my family. I can't support the gym that I had built. I can't support the group home that I'm running. And I can't support my family. Uh, and so I said, I just, I, I can't do it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to lose what I built. And so I sacrificed what I wanted to do uh, so that I can, one, support my family because that came first and two, make sure all the other stuff was running so it didn't drop out from them either. So that's why I ended up leaving because I couldn't make the money I needed to be able to do all those things. So I had to go out and find something that I could do that in and that was wrestling. Right. So you joined the WWF, which is now known as the WWE. And in 97, you made your debut uh, on Monday Night Raw. Uh, around that time, you were billed the world's most dangerous man by ABC News. What was it like to really get into the WWF during that era? Well, I tell you, uh, the beginning of it was uncertainty um, because I, you know, I'd wrestled before that, but this was on a big stage, and me had gone through what I had already gone through with fighting and, and having that legacy. There was a lot of things going on in the background. You know, like sell out, you know, he's going into this fake thing. And so it was a lot of things that weren't good. 
that was going on because I had walked and started doing pro wrestling. There was things that were good, but it was split down the middle, right? The majority of the people didn't really know about UFC yet, right? But the ones that did, most of them didn't like that I was going into pro wrestling. Right. So um, I ended up uh, going there with all this uncertainty, not knowing whether or not I could really play or pretend or act uh, in this manner that they were doing uh, and at, at a very high level. And so I remember going in and I did a few things and it felt comfortable, you know, but I just didn't feel quite there yet. And then they asked me to ref this match with uh, Stone Cold and Bret Hart. And it was a I quit match and a submission match. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. But then these guys were good. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how this is going to work or if I could do this. Because it's been so long and I've been so real for so long. I've been so tough and aggressive and I don't know if I can, if this is going to work, right? So I remember going into the match and, and with this uncertainty, but I want to do the best I can. Like, I want to know if this is going to work or not. So the match starts and I mean, it was probably about five minutes into the match. I'm like, I'm in it. Like, it's like, I don't see, I can't tell the difference between what I was doing in MMA to what I was doing with those guys refing that match. They did such a great job. They were smacking. They were hitting each other. They were aggressive. I mean, like it made me feel right at home when I was refing that match. And so after that, um, I felt like this is I could do this. But what really sunk it in for me, and I'm glad that they gave me Vader first, because if they would have given me anybody else, I'd probably been out of pro wrestling because <laughs> it had been too uh, too aggressive. But because they gave me Vader, I was able to go in there and I was able to find that that happy medium spot. There was a couple things we did in there that were aggressive, but I was able to see it. I was able to feel it and be able to understand what I had to do from that match. Well, I remember I interviewed Mark Henry. And I, I remember during our interview, I said... I mentioned the whole wrestling being fake thing. And he said, he said he wants to punch me in the stomach for saying that. <laughs> when you were watching it back then, did you wonder if it was real or, or, or fake, I guess is how you would say it? <laughs> I would beat you up if you was here in person. Uh, no, re wrestling is not fake. It's predetermined. It's a difference. Yeah, that, that fake thing is not good. And, and I can tell you this. The ending is predetermined. But... It is a very, very tough sport uh, or event. I know most people don't call it a sport, but these guys are getting slammed. They're getting kicked, getting hit with chairs. I mean, these are things that are really happening. Taking those bumps, they have to do that four or five times a week. They get five or, or, or five days to 10 days off. Then they got to go out and do it for another two to three weeks. So it is a grind, man. And I respected it a lot more after I was at that level and I got to see how it was and I got to be a part of it. Boy, it, it, it's, it's not, it's not fake. Right. So you end up having various feuds with Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation. Uh, you had your own pay-per-view, the Your House 16 Canadian Stampede. Uh, these are some pretty epic matches that you were having during that time. Yeah, you know, uh, in my opinion, I think it was probably the greatest time in wrestling, uh, the Attitude Era. Uh, I'm biased a little bit, but a lot of other people feel the same way. It was exciting. There was a lot of things going on, a lot of storylines that were great. You had the, you know, uh, the the Team Canada, Team USA, and uh, it, it was just electrifying. Uh, to be in the ring during that time and hear the crowds was just unbelievable. And uh, that was a great time, great time to be in wrestling. What was the Montreal screw job? <laughs> uh that that was hard uh it was one of those times where here you're working for something and you you're you're bought into it to what it is you need to do how you need to do it and and you trust it you trust the process and then in one night that process that trust it just goes out the window. Like you're just looking at it going, what, what, how does that happen? Our whole, our whole structure 
is built on trust in the ring. All of it. Our whole structure is built that what you say you're going to do, you're going to do. Because if you don't, just like we've seen in the past, people end up walking out of there with broken necks, serious injuries, because that person that said they were going to do something were, was not there. And you ended up having a bad fall. So that trust is a huge, huge deal. For this to come from the top and say that we're going to do something in that wrestling ring that we're not going to tell the guy that's supposed to trust you that it's going to happen. That broke all of the all of the trust, at least for me at that time. I felt like if they could do that to a star like that, who am I? Like, somebody going to hit me with a hammer that's not plastic? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's just, you know, it was a bad time. And things, for me, things started to go downhill after that. Because the, the, it's in the back of your mind, like, that could happen to me. But it could be more serious. Well, that next year, 98, that's when you had the feud with The Rock and the Nation of Domination. Royal Rumble, you end up losing to The Rock via disqualification. Right. Then WrestleMania 14, you would, I guess, won, but then you end up getting disqualified again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brass balls. <laughs> right. And then uh, the King of the Ring tournament. Uh, you end up winning the tournament where you beat uh, Mark Henry, uh, Kama, Jeff Jarrett, and The Rock. When you look at The Rock these days, being one of the biggest names in Hollywood, are you surprised at all, or is it just a natural progression for you? Yeah, I don't know if I'd be surprised, but I would say, you know, happy, because he was a good dude. Um, you know, we had some great matches, but he's a, he's a good guy. He's a great person outside the ring. And so I'm happy for him. But when I saw him and we were working, because he hadn't got there yet when we were together. He was going while we were working. And the one thing that I saw was as soon as they gave him the mic, he took off. I mean, they gave him the ability to be able to cut promos. That put him over the top. And uh, he's he's got to be one, not not the greatest, but one of the greatest at being able to cut promos. That's what really put him where he's at. What was the whole story with the rock hitting you in the face with a metal chair? <laughs> yeah, you seen that one, huh? Uh, yep. There was a, it was, he was talking about wanting to hit me with the chair, right? And the back is weak. Um, in the back of the head, I don't see it coming. The top of the head, that's a weak part. Um, so I just told him, I said, uh, if we're going to do the, the chair shot, hit me in the face. <laughs> I remember he looked at me and I know I'd get that reaction when I said it, right? It's like, hey, just hit me in the face. He's like, Okay, be serious. I said, uh, no, hit me in the face. He's like, I'm not hitting you in the face. I said, no. I said, swing the chair. You're going to hit me right in the face. And I said, when you swing it, I'll take care of myself. He's like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, I'm sure. Just do it. I don't want to get hit in the top of the head. I want to get in the back. I just want to see it coming. And so he goes, okay. And I said, I looked at him. I said, you better swing it. Because <laughs> if you don't, I'm not selling it. He looked at me. He goes, oh, I'll swing it. And uh, he swung it. <laughs> but it, again, everybody keeps looking at that chair shot and they're like, God, that must have hurt. It didn't. It did not hurt. And uh, for whatever reason, I can't get people to, to understand that your forehead is the thickest part of your head. That's why you see football players that can't do it now, but they hit with the forehead. You get knocked out, it's either the side of the head, the temple, the back of the head, you don't see it coming. So that was my reasoning behind that was like, I'm not going to get hit in the top of the head or the back of the head, hit me in the face because I knew when he'd swing it at me, all I got to do is just tuck my chin. It's in the forehead, bang. Okay. And then by October of that year, 98, you end up becoming a heel. And so, so. you actually <laughs> won the, yeah. the Intercontinental uh, Championship where you uh, defeated X-Pac. How did it feel to be the intercontinental champion of the WWF? Accomplishment. Like, you know, here I was coming in there from the UFC, not sure. And then having that opportunity, king of the ring, intercontinental champion, tag team champion, you know, 
uh, it felt like I was on my way. Like, this is the path you have to go, right? You got to do King of the Ring. You got to be, you know, a tag team, intercontinental, and then up to the challenging for the title. And The Rock went there after I captured the intercontinental title. He went up and started working. So I felt like it was going to be The Rock, Stone Cold, Bret Hart, Ken Shamrock. There was going to be that, that fight for that, that title. But as we talked about earlier, yeah, the uh, screw job, that put ice on it. Yeah, because Brett even said, and this was the reason why they did, I think, um, and not positive, it's just my take on it, why the screw job happened was because Brett didn't want to put over Shawn Michaels. And that he told me that he wanted to lose it to me. He wanted to put me over. And so I was like, cool. Uh, but at the time, I didn't realize that the office wasn't, a, wasn't with this. I didn't know, right? I was like, oh, great. They, we're we're going to get there. Like, me and The Rock are going to go at it. Didn't happen. The screw job happened. And then, like I told you, from that point on, man, it was, we started going downhill from there. And I, I believe it was because I trained with Brett. Uh, I went to a Calgary and worked out with them at Stu's place. And uh, I became close to that group. And when that happened, uh, Brett came into the locker room and I was in there with all those guys. And of course, when Vince went in there, he told them to, everybody to leave. And of course, we all left. But that's when Brett, you know, hit Vince and uh, all that stuff happened. So I think I was kind of lumped in uh, with the, what do you call it, the Canada connection. And so they didn't trust uh, where we were going from that point in time. Okay, and then that same year, you and Big Boss Man ended up being the New Age Outlaws, which made you guys the WWF Tag Team Champions. So that made you a dual champion. You were the Tag Team Champion and the Intercontinental Champion. I had a lot of brass. Uh, <laughs> got to carry him on each shoulder, but working with Boss Man was awesome. He was a good dude. Really liked him. Um, great to work with. But it really, it, it, it really made me feel like that, just like I was talking about earlier, that I was on my way, like I was making that move uh, to be up there in the top four, challenging for the heavyweight belt. Um, of course, unfortunately, uh, that did not happen, but it was a great time because I really felt like things were clicking, great time in wrestling. You know, I had two belts and uh, I felt like my skills were getting better and better all the time, like every single time, felt like my matches were getting better and better and better. So UFC 19, Ortiz ended up beating Guy Metzger. What ends up happening next? Yeah, that start the heat when when uh, when uh, Ortiz actually, and again, you go back and watch the fight. I was working the corner, and me and Ortiz didn't have any issues there. It was more between Guy and him through you know social media. They were going back and forth. and So they had their own little heat going on, and they get into this fight, and Guy had already beat him once. And so they go for the rematch, and they're fighting, and they're both exhausted. And Tito has side control, guys on his knees, and he's throwing these punches like this, and he's on the side of him, but they're, they're landing in the back of his head because he's on all fours and he's got his head down. Ortiz is laying on him because they're both exhausted. It's towards the end of the fight and it's, they're exhausted. So he's just throwing these, like this, just doing this, right? And guy's covering up. And I remember guy screaming, he's hit me in the back of the head. And I'm telling John, hey, he's hitting him back of the head. So John stops the fight. And we're thinking, okay, cool, he's going to warn him. Well, then he, he said that uh, Guy was not protecting himself and he awarded the fight to Tito. And we're like, John, he was hitting him in the back of the head. What are you, doing? What are you talking about? And he, he wasn't hitting him hard enough to hurt him. And uh, so, you know, obviously it went to deaf ears. That's what they're supposed to do is just ignore us. Um, and so then as we're doing that, I'm over the top of the cage and I'm talking to Guy and I said, don't worry about it, man. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it back. We'll come back. And well, Tito has this, this, this this attitude where he turns around and just goes, uh, and it was it was like it wasn't directed at me, but it felt like it was directed at the team, and so I came unglued, and that's where we have that rivalry with me and Tito was that that's where it all started, and that's why we actually came back and did the fights uh, to try to build on that rivalry, but that's where it started because he also put on the a shirt that said something about being a bitch. 
<laughs> so yeah, it said a uh, gay Metzger is my bitch. Yes, right. And so it was disrespectful. And I'm a guy, and you do whatever you want before a fight. Just build it, say, talk, do what you want. But after the fight is over, it's like kicking a dead horse. Stop. Like, don't do that. That's cheap. It's like you win and now you're gonna talk smack. Move on to the next guy. Who are you gonna fight next? So it just felt cheap to me. So I made it heard. I made him uh, make sure he heard me um, and that it was disrespectful. And that's how that that whole thing started with me and Tito Ortiz. Okay, but you're still in WWF. Yes. And uh, the corporation, your crew, starts to beef with Undertaker and the Ministry of Darkness. You end up leaving the corporation and then you end up turning face again. And you end up beefing with the Undertaker and you lost. And then you started to beef with uh, Chris Jericho. And was that around the time you ended up leaving the WWF? It was. Yeah, my, I believe my last match was Jericho, I believe. Could be wrong, yeah. but it felt like that was the last one. I, I already felt like, like I was being clumped into groups and that I was just kind of a side thing now. Like whatever storyline was over here, we would just do. It didn't make any sense. Like... It just didn't feel like they knew what to do with me from that point. It just felt like I was just there. So I felt like I had went there because I didn't have a way to be able to support the lifestyle that I had done. So I went into pro wrestling, figuring I'd go do that, have some fun. I ended up falling in love with it. I did. I really liked it. Um, but where we were at at that point in time, it just felt like they weren't really using me at the level that I thought I should have been used just because of where I came from. And for me to stay there and just be second fiddle when I could go and do something and be first fiddle, um, especially with um, how I was able to draw and bring in crowds, I felt like, and make more money, I felt like I could do that better um, in the mixed martial arts world because it came back. So that's when I decided, like, if they're not going to use me and really put me in anything that's serious, then I'm going to move on. And so that's what I did. I had opportunities to do other things. Um, and, it was, and it was always in my back of my head, too, that it was different then, too, because that trust was kind of broken. Well, you end up going back to MMA. You signed with Pride. Your first fight was the Pride Grand Prix 2000, where you beat uh, Alexander Otsuka uh, by KO. Uh, and then at Pride 10, you end up fighting uh, Kazuyuki Fujita, yeah. where he, they threw in the towel. Well, you actually threw in the towel. I Sorry. Did, yes, yes. You threw in the towel I, because I did, you felt- I did. corner did, yes. Yeah. Because you felt like you were having a heart attack. Well, yes. I, actually, it was because I couldn't see. But come find out later, it was something else. So it was literally, I was seeing black blotches. I was winning the fight. I mean, I was dominating him. And it just went, I ran, I don't know. I, to this day, I still know what it was, but it was all these, I, it was like just turned white and I couldn't see anything. And that's why they said they thought maybe it had something to do with my heart. But, you know, after I went and checked, it was, it was no heart attack or anything like that. Well, that next year, Don Fry who I've interviewed before. Very interesting character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he started to, what people call it today is trolly. He started to troll you, essentially. And I guess, you know, you end up getting a divorce from your wife and you started to date Alicia Webb, right. who later on was known as Ryan Shamrock. Right. And Fry started to make comments on you saying that, oh, you cheated on your wife just to date a young girl, who I guess was 19 <laughs> at the time, you were 35. I told him to stop being jealous. <laughs> right. And uh, that sort of created a whole kind of thing where, you know, there was trash talk going either way. And, you know, Dan Severn, he spoke about it. He said, uh, I saw Ken Shanrock uh, whoop Dan Severn at UFC 6. And I thought, that's a guy I got to fight. Anybody who can whoop Dan Severn like that has got to be a man that I want to test my size against his size. I had the chance to uh, talk trash. and They gave me the fight. I crossed the line. I wasn't very professional about it. And when I interviewed Fry, he said, uh, I got my panties in a wad. He was getting all the attention in the UFC, but never won a tournament. So that's why he started to basically mess with you. Right. The next year in Pride, you fought Ken Shamrock. Yes. 
And uh, that was a momentous fight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ken showed up to come to fight, you know. <laughs> well, that was an epic fight. And you guys kind of had a rivalry leading up to this. Yeah. But, um, but you guys hugged it out after this. Yeah, I I was, I got my panties in a wad because um, <laughs> Ken Shamrock was getting all the notoriety of, you know, the UFC because he had a hell of a body, you know, shit. Yeah. But he never won the UFC, he never finished a tournament. So it pissed me off, you know, hurt my feelings. So I started talking a lot of shit about Ken. <laughs> and, you know, he said, enough of this nonsense, boy, let's fight. And it worked because you ended up getting a fight with him. Yeah. Well, it wasn't my, I, I would fight anybody they put in front of me. So it didn't matter to me who, who they fought. I mean, who they wanted me to fight because I wasn't in control of that. So he had to, he had to get them uh, to get the fight because I didn't make the fight. So he was doing that to try to get them to get the fight and it worked, right? I mean, I, I didn't care one way or the other who I fought. So, but Don Fry and me and Don are friends and we have been friends. Uh, and, and it's because he understands he went too far. He understands that, right? It's like, you don't attack somebody's family. It's a fight, right? Stay in the fight world. Um, he came, he actually attacked my father, said some things about my father. And, you know, he knew that was out of bounds. And so for him to come up and, and do that and say, hey, I'm sorry, I went too far, that, that's, a, that's a first class man, right? He knew it went too far. So me and him are, are really good. We're, we're, we're cool. Um, so, but I really appreciated that because sometimes you get in the middle of these things and you say things you shouldn't say. So it's really cool that when you do that, you know it and you tell them, Hey bro, I went past the line, man. Well, uh, that was a hell of a fight pride 19. And I remember when I talked to Don about this, he said that both you guys left a big piece of yourselves in that ring, that both you got really, really hurt from that fight. So you won that fight in a split decision. Yes, sir. But most people said that after that, neither one of you were the same. You no, guys really we hurt. Both hurt. Left, we both left a big piece in the, in the ring. Yeah, you guys both really got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I took, I've never been knocked out, ever been knocked out. And so he knocked me out. I did, obviously, I didn't, he didn't win by knockout because I recovered and put him in an ankle lock and broke his ankle. So it was, uh, it was damage done by both people, but like I said, I'd never been hit that hard. And so both, both of us are really tough. And we're, it's going to take a lot more than one or two things to put us out. We're going to keep coming no matter what. And that's what we did in that fight. And it took a lot out of us. Yeah, he ended up winning by split decision. Right. And it was interesting because I remember I brought up uh, his fight against uh, Yoshihiro Takeyama which is considered the manliest MMA fight ever. I don't understand that. You say a manly fight when you allow another man to hit you. Because <laughs> that's what they were doing. They were trading punches. Right. I was like, no, you're supposed to move. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen anything like that. To have two men punch each other in the face like 40, 50 times and just stand there and continue to do it. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Have you ever seen anything like that? I before? don't. I, 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 I've never seen it. And I, if I, if I ever had a fighter do that, I would say you're done because <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to walk out of here with your brains if you keep doing that. <laughs> okay. So then that year you signed a one year deal with uh, TNA, which is a uh, was a brand new, uh, brand new uh, wrestling federation at that point, and you end up winning the the heavyweight championship which made you the TNA's first ever world champion. Yeah, that was exciting. Um, I didn't know they were going to do that. And uh, when they told me that, I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And so I remember when I won the championship, it was you could see I was really excited because um, I was the first. Like, that's never going to change. And for them to have that trust in me, to be able to carry the organization meant a lot. Okay, and that same year, UFC 40 happens when you finally get to fight Tito Ortiz. Yeah, I'm not sure that um, that was my desire because <laughs> if you remember, obviously, when I when we were going to go fight, obviously, I was excited about fighting, right? But if, if I was going to do that fight, I wish they would come to me like 10 years earlier because <laughs> uh, if you remember, I think I was in my late uh, mid-40s or late 40s or something like that when I fought him. 
uh, and he was 26 or 27 in his prime. And probably at that time, pound for pound, the best fighter in the world. Uh, I mean, he was, he was, he was dominant. So it was, uh, you know, when they came to me with that fight, obviously me being a fighter, I was excited to do it. But in the back of my head, which I wouldn't let it take over my thoughts, I knew that I, I had to get lucky. I knew I had to do something to be able to at least stay in the fight long enough for him to be able to come down to my level, which is get tired. And, uh, and so that just never happened. But they offered me the fights every time. And remember, it wasn't me going after them. They came to me because the organization was dying. And uh, they came to me because I, I, I put numbers up. I always have. So they came to me to revive the organization, to put the fight together with Tito Ortiz because we had a rivalry, because of the thing with Guy Mesker. And so when they said that, I was all in because this is my legacy. If it dies, so does my legacy. So I wasn't going to let that happen. So I took the fight. Right. And right before round four, uh, you guys threw in the towel. Yes. Yeah, that was the first fight. Yeah, that, that yeah. was a title fight. Exactly. Yeah, I guess uh, you were fighting with a torn ACL. Yeah, it, that that's not what hindered me. I mean, I had, I was, I was, <laughs> listen, I was older. I had a lot of injuries. Um, he was just a better fighter, period. And I had to get lucky. I had to bring him into deep waters, get him tired, uh, and hopefully make a mistake and catch him. Uh, I took punishment trying to do that. Uh, I went four rounds uh, and just got pummeled. But I felt like, you know, I want to keep it going and going because uh, if he got tired, I could catch him. And uh, they end up stopping the fight. I didn't, at the time, it wasn't my suggestion because I wanted to go out on my shield. I, I would have went in and did the last round. Um, but my corner said, dude, you don't need to take anymore. You've done enough. You're, you're, you've already created this. You, you, you don't need to go out there and put yourself in harm's way. And they had to talk to me about it. And finally, I said, okay. Um, and it was the right move. It was the right call, right? I mean, because uh, it could have been a lot worse. Well, then that next year, 2003, uh, you and Hoist Gracie got inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. The first two people inducted. Dana White said, uh, we feel that no two individuals are more deserving than Hoist and Ken to be the charter members. Their contributions to our sport, both inside and outside the octagon, may never be equaled. How did that feel? Special. I mean, like, you work your whole career to be a champion. And then after you become champion, you work your whole career to be a two-time champion and then so on and so on. But when it's all said and done, the greatest compliment to any individual that competes in a sport is to be honored by your peers and by your fans. And that is to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Okay. Oddly enough, though, you've never gotten into the WWE Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's not odd. <laughs> that's not odd. Nah? That's not odd. Okay. Uh, that's that's just, you know, just people. Some people just don't like me, you know. Mm. Uh, and I I can't control that. You know, I think that if you look at what a Hall of Fame thing is, it's about if somebody comes in and literally changes things in an organization. Uh makes people guard you differently, uh, changes the way that rules are being brought up, scoring points, doing moves. Uh, you know, you look at pro wrestling, and before Ken Shamrock, they had rest holds. They had the sharpshooters, but they didn't have arm bars. They didn't have chokes. They didn't have leg locks. They didn't have the ankle lock. And they did not have tap out. They had I give up or I quit. But no tap outs. Now you see submissions everywhere. You see tap outs all the time. So I think that when you have an individual that comes in and can change an event like that, that's pretty special. Well, 2004, UFC 48 comes around. You end up beating Kimo Leopoldo, which was a rematch from UFC 8. Right. You, you won by KO. The Ultimate Fighter Team Couture versus Team Liddell uh, finale uh, in 2005. You lost to Rich Franklin. But then in 2006, in UFC 61, you had the rematch with Tito Ortiz. How do you think that went from your point of view? 
Uh, you know, it was kind of, that was same thing. Uh, they were starting to get traction. You know, UFC fighter was building. It was giving them some opportunity. The fans wanted to see the Tito Ortiz Kid Shamrock 2. Me, I wanted it again because I felt like, you know, I went to three or four rounds into him with it. I felt like, you know, let's give it another shot. See if we can't do better because I'm a competitor. Like, I have always been able to overcome adversity. And I felt like this was adversity and that I could figure out a way to win and then go out. And so I took the second fight because I felt like I needed to re at least try to avenge that. And of course, it, it, it went worse. I mean, it stopped it a lot sooner, even though in my opinion, I think everyone else's opinion, and that's why we did the third one, was they stopped it way too soon. I mean, like the punishment I took in the, in the first one, and then they stopped it on what, one punch or two punches that landed, they stopped it. I'm like jumping up going, why didn't you stop that after that first fight? At least let me get there. <laughs> and so that's why we did the third one was because that, Obviously, that that second one was really premature. Right. So you did uh, Ortiz versus Shamrock Three, the final chapter where Ortiz beat you by KO. Uh, John McCarthy stopped it after he felt there were some undefended uh, fist strikes. Yeah, there's no question. I was, you know, again my mentality because even in the second one, it really wasn't even long enough to even know what my abilities would have been with him. I just felt like that was just way too soon. I didn't even get to really get a chance. But in that third one, he was so, he was just dominating. There was just, I mean, I knew going in after I grabbed him, I started rolling with him. I realized at that point, it was like, yeah, this is not going to go well. So they, he did a good, I thought John did the right thing. Well, right after Ortiz beat you, he gave you the middle finger. He did a, a grave digger routine. And uh, being the king of t-shirts that he is, he put on a shirt that said, punishing him into retirement. But then I guess you approached him and you guys talked. And at that point, you guys shook hands and you buried the hatchet. Yeah. I realized who Tito was, right? Uh, Tito's a guy that's building hype. And although I may not agree with it, like once you beat somebody, it's like, you know, pouring salt into a wound. It, 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 why? Um, but that was his thing. He just wanted to keep building his image, keep building his reputation, the bad boy of Huntington Beach. So I didn't take it personal, but just like, that's his thing. Do what he does. He beat me, right? There's nothing that I can say or do that's going to change what he's doing. And so I just wanted to make sure, because I knew this would be my last time. And that I wanted to make sure I left on a good note, not a, a sour note. So I took the high road. Well, in 2009, you ended up testing positive for steroids. And you got a one-year suspension. Was steroid use just flagrant in the <laughs> UFC at that point? Yeah. Hey, I don't know. I mean, I think that any logical person can figure out that, you know, sports is just covered in stuff. It's just the way it yeah. is. And people find ways to cheat. I never found a way to cheat because I never really had to. In other circumstances that I had to do something was probably when I was injured. Um, and that, you know, there was traces of it from that recovery. So, I mean, I never denied it, you know, as far as it being there, um, it was what it was. Uh, and I didn't make excuses of why I did it, right? Um, but it was definitely from injuries and recovering from an injury, trying to rebuild it quicker because you're trying to get back in the ring faster. It just didn't get out of my system. Well, in 2010, a year later, you had a bunch more fights. You're now 46 years old, really just taking on a lot of punishments. And, you know, a lot of people kind of criticized you of fighting past your prime during that time. There, there was, you know, a bunch of articles and people taking shots at you, writers and so forth. Did you feel at that point you should have stopped or, or no? No. Um, there's one thing that I never wanted to do. I didn't want to walk away from something that I truly loved doing unless I knew that it was time. I, I hear all the people talk about, you know, going out and fishing when they retire, go out hunting or, you know, doing whatever they do when they want to retire. You know what I wanted to do when I retired? 
I wanted to fight in small organizations. I wanted to go out there and compete, train, have fun doing it, not having any expectations of winning or losing. Just go and do it because I love being in the gym. I love training with people. I love preparing for fights and I love going in there and entertaining people by fighting. I loved it. It was in my DNA. I didn't want to walk away from it. I wanted to find a way to do it where I wasn't going to endanger myself. And in other words, trying to fight for any title or fight for rankings, but just fight mid cards, lower level and have fun doing it. And uh, that's what I did. And I know I took a lot of criticism for it, but it's my life to live. And I just try to get people to understand that their retirement and what they feel they want to do to retire, I'm not going to question them on what they want to do when they retire. But when I retired, I wanted to keep fighting. I want to fight in lower level organizations and I want to have fun doing it. In 2012, you were at a mall in Modesto and uh, a fight broke out, which you try to break up. <laughs> and things were kind of left <laughs> during the course of you breaking up this fight. Do you want to explain what happened? No, but you got to explain to me which one it was. <laughs> okay, so I guess there was a fight that happened and you try to break it was up. Was it the girl? A girl jumped on your back. You <laughs> thought it was a thought man. It was a boy. <laughs> you thought it was a boy. <laughs> Yeah. So what did you do to this girl after thinking it was a boy? Yeah, I remember we it was me and a friend of mine, Dan Severn, who was my, my strength conditioning coach. We were in, in Modesto and uh, we went to this mall and this, this this fight broke out. And this one, I didn't know it was a girl type, but these two, this 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 person walked up and this this girl, she went after this girl and started punching her. And literally had him down and was kicking him. And so I went in to break it up. And then all of a sudden, this other person came from behind and tried to, 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 to hit me. And I turned around and my, and before I could actually throw the punch and hit him, <laughs> my, uh, my buddy, uh, Dan, literally, he's 260 pounds. He's shredded, right? And he just throws this wicked clothesline, pro wrestling clothesline, <laughs> and just nails this kid. And does a flip, lands on the ground. And I was like, when they hit the ground, all of a sudden we realized the girl coming across the street that was going out with this girl starts screaming, she's a girl. And we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> this 260 pound friend of mine just clocked this girl. We're like, we didn't know that. We just thought they were jumping this girl. These two guys were jumping this girl. <laughs> so it was... Uh, it was, I was this close to probably uh, being arrested for assault. <laughs> okay. And uh, ultimately charges were dropped. They said no, there was no charges. Defense. They investigated yeah. it. They just, it was, yeah, it, it was, it was gone. It was, thank you. <laughs> right. Well, one of our YouTube members, uh, Jumbo Incredible, he actually brought up a little tidbit I didn't know about. In 2014, you were 50 cents bodyguard? Yes. Yes. Okay. How'd you get that job? I was going out and I was actually putting a business together and it was going to be ultimate protection. And so I felt like if, if I was going to do this, I need to get out and actually experience it to see what the field was like. Cause I did it when I was younger, you know, in college and stuff. And so I was thinking about putting a business together. So I wanted to go out and, and see what it was. So I had a friend that was in the security business who hooked me up with some of these other celebrities that I was going to start working and doing uh, protection with and to kind of get a, a feel for how that industry was. And so 50 Cent was one of them that um, I had connected with. And I remember when I was doing that security with him, um, it was it was probably maybe six months into this, I realized that, yeah, this industry is, it's really tricky. It's, it's, uh, it's very difficult. And what I was going to do is I was going to take military and in fact, we talked to uh, some high-end uh, military uh, officers to be able to try to get people that were coming out of the military and that they would give us a heads up and we would go to them and offer them an opportunity to come work. Because what we were going to do is because they were, most of them that were coming out knew how to use a weapon already. What we were going to do is teach them how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat and develop the security that was a high-level security where they would, they would have a high experience in firearms and they would have a high level in grappling. 
And we felt like if we could put that together and have that in a resume, we would have a great business. Um, unfortunately, um, with the experience that I had with 50 Cent and some others, the industry was really dying as far as uh, bodyguards. Okay. Anything crazy happened with 50 Cent or any other celebrity? Never. No. I. You know, if you're successful in being a uh, protection, nothing happens ever. And, uh, and that's all by the way that you handle yourself all the way by your facial expressions and your body action. Uh, most of the time you could deter anything from happening. Um, and that's what you want. So I think I, I think that, um, I put myself at a pretty high level as far as being that kind of person when I'm working and trying to protect somebody or keep a situation calm. Uh, I was able to do that all the time and really de de deter any kind of action. Well, that next year, 2015, you're age 51 at the time. You end up competing in Bellator 138 with Kimbo Slice. You end up uh, taking a TKO at two minutes and 22 seconds of the first round. And there's a lot of controversy around this. Some people <laughs> felt that you took a dive. <laughs> yeah, I did it for the money. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. That's, 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 you know, if you really know me, you, 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 that's, you wouldn't, that's just, to me, it was just crazy. It's like the, the work that I put in, the effort, the, the years, the damage to my body, um, it's just an insult. It, it's an insult because, uh, that's not, that's not in my DNA. I don't go in there and do that stuff. Not, not. Not in that instance, no way. UFC is a different ball game. Um, that's the real deal. And so sometimes things are said like that and some people say it and they don't realize the effect that it could have on me uh, when something's said like that. So um, that's why I, I take a hard stand when it's said because I don't want it to get out of control. I don't want anybody to ever be thinking something's going to happen like that. Because that's not me, not in the UFC. That's not going to happen. Um, and so I know when it did happen, I got pretty aggressive with it, make sure that it didn't. But um, I don't hate anybody for it, obviously, because they've got to have their own thoughts, right? I was a great fighter at one time. And for when, they, when someone sees me and even trained with me at times, um, sees something like that happen, their mind is like, there's no way that can happen to Ken Shamrock. But Hey, age gets to everyone. Yeah, Father Time's undefeated. Yes. Uh, and then that next year, Kimbo Slice end up, ends up uh, passing away. Yeah. Uh, Dan Wetzel, the author, uh, did a eulogy for Kimbo Slice, and he described you as a tomato can in that eulogy. <laughs> Do you love guys that know history? You just got to love them. <laughs> tomato can. Yes, <laughs> that speaks a lot about UFC in the early days, right? Yes, it was weak, no competition. Hoist Gracie sucks. <laughs> I was a tomato can. <laughs> well, speaking of Hoist Gracie, 2016, you're age 52 at the time. Bellator 149, you fought Hoist Gracie. This was 21 years after the last fight. How did that go from your point of view? Uh, yeah, I think disgraceful. It was very disgraceful. Um, and to this day, I still question it of how a referee cannot give me time to be able to recover from a groin shot. I, I Yeah, that one there is bewildering to me because it was pretty clear. I mean, he, they showed it on the Jumbotron. I think the audience spoke their mind very clearly. Um, they were booing big time because when that happened, um, it was pretty clear that the, the the knee went low and that I was telling the referee he hit me in the groin as I'm trying to hold my cup and push it down. And when we got up, I felt like they were going to give me time to recover. Instead, they brought to the center and they raised both of our hands. And I was like, are they calling it? Like, are they... What are they doing? Like, I didn't understand it at first. Like, I thought that they, they called it a draw or like a no contest or, you know, or, or something. And then they put my hand down and then they raised his. I was like, what just happened? Like, they didn't see that. And then it's even more so. Um, I actually sent a, 
a uh, pictures of the the bruising and the swelling that I had down there because it was a hard shot and my cup literally slid up to my belly button. And uh, so when I sent a picture of the bruising and the swelling, they ignored it, just didn't do anything about it. And so to me, I think when we talk about the biggest regrets, obviously I have, you know, some others, but that one there just, it, it just, that one's going to sit with me forever just because it's like, that was one they robbed myself and they robbed the fans of a real fight. They didn't allow it to happen because they could have easily done a rematch. And what would have been even easier is for them to give me five minutes. Like, let me recover because I would have fought no matter what happened. Just let me get rid of the pain. Let me fight. And they didn't give me that chance. Well, in 2019, on your Facebook page, you announced that you have no plans to fight again. What led up to you essentially retiring at that point? Yeah, I mean, I've always said that I'll never say the word retire, right? But I think it was just the way that the, the last couple of fights have went. You know, the Kimbo Slice one where, you know, I felt he tapped, you know, um, it didn't happen. Uh, I just felt like I, I wasn't finishing fights. Like I wasn't like, like I was like, go past that point to just dominating and finishing. And so, and it was becoming a point to where I felt like I was endangering, also put myself in danger because I wasn't able to do the things that I needed to do. If I was just going to go in and have fun and do the fights and enjoy this and kind of do it until I couldn't do it anymore, um, I had to be at least be able to protect myself. And I felt I got to a point to where I was getting so slow that I was literally putting myself in harm's way. Well, and then in 2020, you got inducted into the Impact Hall of Fame, a.k.a. TNA. How did that feel? Yeah, it was, like, like I said, you know, anything like with the UFC or anything like that, it really just speaks to being able to be honored. But And you also know that it's it's forever, right? You're in there and it's not going away. So it's special. I mean, it's like you you work all this way in doing things. And then you know that that, that payoff there, that they they'd have appreciated it. Well, we fast forward to 2022, this year. Vince McMahon was always such a, a huge figure in WWE and WWF before then. But then in April of 2022, an investigation started where they found that uh, there's $3 million in hush money that he paid over affairs with former employees of the company. Uh, there was also other, you know, agreements that he paid off Various people that totaled like $12 million. Uh, initially, McMahon said he'd step down as a CEO, uh, but oversee content de uh, development. But then on July, he said he was officially retired from the WWE. From your point of view, what did you think of all that? Well, uh, anytime that you're at that level and that you have that much power, I think you're going to see things like that happen and people take advantage of, of their power. It hasn't been a secret. I mean, like, there's always been allegations, and I don't think anybody really truly believes they weren't true. I think they just believe that they, like you, we we know now, they were just paid off or, you know, hush money. So, it, this is no shock. I mean, like, we live in this world, and it happens all the time. What was your relationship with Vince McMahon over the years? Yeah, I, Vince was always good to me. I mean, even when I went to him and told him I wanted out. Um, you know, obviously some of the things that happened and the way they were using me, I wasn't happy with, but I don't know if he was in directly involved with that or not. But um, I just, like I said, he was, I treat people the way they treat me and he always treated me well. So, Well, there was a lot of controversy over the years uh, with the WWE and steroid use. I remember when I interviewed New Jack, he said, Vince McMahon's a piece of shit. Every time a wrestler dies, he gets away with it. What do you think overall about Vince McMahon? Plain and simple, he's a piece of shit. You had mentioned that Vince McMahon had blood on his hands and he keeps getting away with murder. Owen Hart, when he died. Okay, he died at a show in the ring. And Vince still had the show. The show went on. You know, and 
his wife sued him. I think she sued him. You know what I mean? But it was like every time something would happen with one of his wrestlers, he would br he would brush shit over like it didn't happen. You know what I mean? And time would go by, and he's like, okay, we'll we'll let that go away. What the fuck ever? You know what I'm saying? And I was just like, how in the fuck does this guy every time somebody dies, he gets away with it? You know, and that's why I said he had blood on his hands. That's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, why is Vince? Why is Vince responsible? What? Uh, since when do people not take responsibility for their own actions? Like, how do you blame somebody for what you're doing to yourself? That doesn't make sense to me. I mean, Vince is no angel, man. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I mean, obviously I know and I'm not best friends with him, right? But he's never treated me wrong and that's just the way it is. I don't have a close relationship with him. I'm not friends with him, but he never treated me badly. So that's where it stays. But to blame somebody for something you're doing to yourself, I don't get it. Yeah. During the course of your WWF career, do you feel like you hurt yourself more doing pro wrestling or MMA? Oh, no doubt. Pro wrestling is where I get more damage. I got more damage. MMA is an area where I was good, right? So when I went into a fight, I could finish a guy in a minute two minutes and on to the next. Uh, even when I had tough fights, I was good enough not to take damage because I'd take them down. I didn't get into the, the, the slug batches with people. I took them down, worked the submission game, less damage. When I went into a pro wrestling ring, I had to give them my body. Like It wasn't like I could defend myself and stop them from slamming me. <laughs> They're going to slam me because that's part of the program. So I had to do that for three weeks in a row, go home for five days, go back out on the road for two weeks, go back home for three days, go back out on the road for 10 days, go back home for a week. So you were constantly three to four times every single week getting slammed, getting hit with chairs, put through tables, taking bumps for three years. It's a lot of bumps, man. It's a lot of punishment on your body that you're allowing to happen. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I interviewed Tito Ortiz and we get into his list of injuries and he starts mentioning all the, the serious damage situation, all of the operations and so forth. It was like crazy, like this operation, this operation, this, uh, you know, hurt disc here, slip disc there, rotator cuff here, this, that. And it's hard, and the bodies uh, can't take that much damage. I mean, I've had eight surgeries myself through my uh, career. I've had ACL replacing my left knee, ACL replacing my right knee, 50% of my meniscus taken on my right knee, L4-5, S1 fused in my lower back, T3, T2, T2, T1, T1, C7 disc replacement, C7, C6 fuse, C6, C5 fuse, C5, C4 disc replacement, and a reattached retina, and probably about um, maybe... 10 to 12 concussions. You know, you watch movies like The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, and you know, there's that scene where he's signing autographs, he's looking around the room, and this guy's in a wheelchair, this guy's got a leg brace, this guy's got a cane. One guy's got a bag he's pissing in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, would you agree that this is what happens with most MMA fighters or most wrestlers in particular when they get older, that their bodies just get destroyed in that fashion? Of course. And it doesn't happen in the fights. It happens in training because you got to put so much more time in training and put yourself in all those bad situations uh, so that you're prepared for the worst in the ring. And you got to do that for three months when you're training for a fight. In wrestling, you've got to be able to go in the ring at least, at least in a week, three times a week, you're doing events and house shows. And then you're leading up to a pay-per-view where you're going to even go bigger. And in those matches, you're taking seven to eight bumps in one match as, and even taking kicks and punches. They're still landing. They're not in full force, but you're still taking them. And then you're taking chairs and tables and all these other things. And you're doing it three to four times a week for three weeks straight before you lead into a pay-per-view. That's a lot of punishment on your body that goes on constantly every single year. Like, if you're doing it for three years, it doesn't stop. 
It's like being a rock star, right? They're on the road all the time and they've got shows they're performing. It's a grind even for them and they're not even taking bumps. Right. I mean, I I remember going through the research before I interviewed New Jack and the types of things that he was doing to his body. Like, remember that huge dive that he did (laughs) when he hit like whatever, 10 tables stacked on top of each other? uh, And that's not the first time he did it. Like, I mean, the guy does it again somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of amazing, you know, getting hit in the face with folding metal chairs, getting thrown off the top ropes, going off balconies, like, yeah, man, listen, I, I don't know how you guys do it, honestly. I, I absolutely don't know how you do it. Right, well, you know, when I think that's why when someone says, even though they don't mean any disrespect, they're just uneducated, but when someone says wrestling's fake, and they're not being insulting, they just don't know any better, that's why you see wrestlers or fans take an insult to that because they know what these wrestlers go through no absolutely and speaking of that you actually have a new league that's on your shirt right now yeah valor bare knuckle um this is one that uh you know when i was fighting um fighting saved my life i mean literally it got me off the streets it gave me a career it gave me an opportunity to do something i love and it and I got to be very good at it. And I, I I started Valor because I felt like, you know, if this did this for me, um, I have an opportunity to be able to turn around and pay it forward. I get an opportunity to get an organization and be able to help other men and women follow their dreams. And so that's one of the one of the main reasons why I did it. Also, too, I felt like I have an opportunity I could make it better. Like you know, even the rule sets, the way we, we we fight, making it more exciting for the fans and also more action for the fighters. The bout circle, um, there's no rings, or there's no uh, ropes, there's no cages, it's a pit. It's a bout circle where you can see in there and there's nothing in your way. Reason why I did that was because I wanted to be more fan friendly. I wanted to be able to sit there and be able to have an experience and be able to get what they pay for. If they buy a, a ticket in the front row, you don't want to have to be looking through ropes or cages. I mean, you spent money on a good seat. You should get a good seat. So that was in mind when we did the the, the bout circle was that want to make it more uh, friendly to people who were going to pay for you know, the tickets and they wanted those good seats. We wanted to make sure they were good seats. Um, so all these things that are happening in, in Valor are things that I think that we can make better and try to improve in the combat space. So when you say bare knuckle, Does that mean no gloves at all? True bare knuckle. God-given talent. Uh, You see see sometimes when someone says, hey, you want to go see a bare knuckle fight? And then you watch it and you're like, that's not bare knuckle. It's like they got tape on their hands. It's like, what are you trying to get somebody killed? It's like, let me tape your hand and then I got my knuckles exposed and we'll just go ahead and punch and we'll make it more dangerous. It's like, it's crazy. It's like true bare knuckle. Because it forces fighters to have to be accurate. Then you put a tape on their hands. It means that they, now they can literally punch with a bare knuckle and it'll hurt you. I mean, seriously hurt you and not damage their hand. Because now they got a protection on their hand. And they don't have to be as accurate. So without the tape, it forces you to have to be more accurate. You can't punch as hard. Because if you miss, you know you're going to break your hand. So now you have to slow down your punches. And you have to be more professional, more accurate with your striking. You got to use footwork because you can't stand there and parry punches because there's no glove to parry them. It's too small. If you try to parry them, you're going to get hit. So it's really upping the game uh, of striking and making people become more professional in striking. And it's cleaner. How did you feel when boxing and MMA kind of merged when McGregor fought Mayweather? I love it. Um, I think we're seeing that trend now. You see influencers who are coming in and and mixing it up and it's, it's, I think it's exciting. And I, I see people getting angry about it. I'm like, why? It's like, this is great for the sport when more people want to watch it. And so, uh, yeah, I just think it's great. I think that it's, we're being able to open it to more eyes. You get more people involved because you're not just bringing in a boxing crowd. Now you're bringing in an influencer crowd. You're bringing in other people who are going, hey, what's going on over there? Because there's a lot of ruckus going on. So 
it's really making a bigger event. So I'm all for it and I love it. I think it's great. As long as you're not putting a fight together with someone's going to get hurt, they're out that much outmatched. That, that's where the tricky part is. Right, because uh, Jake Paul's next fight is supposed to be with UFC champ Anderson Silva. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yes. How do you think that's going to go? I'll tell you, man, it's going to be tricky because if the Anderson Silva uh, comes out that we know, it's going to be a long night. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, I know what it's like to get old. I know what it's like to slow down. I know what it's like to be a split second slower. You may still look the same, but you you, you don't realize that you're a split second slower, which causes you to miss or get hit. And I think uh, Silva's at that point now, whereas he might be a little bit slower and that's going to give opportunities for him to be able to get hit a whole lot more than he normally would. Right, because Silva's 47, Jake Paul is 25. <laughs> Sounds like Tito and Ken Shamrock. <laughs> <laughs> right. Part, like, yeah. part four. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, as someone who's devoted uh, their whole life to fighting, how would you really rate Jake Paul as a boxer? I think he's tough. Um, I think uh, Jake's got uh, skills. No question. He's worked at it. I know he's gotten better from his first fight to where he is right now. So he's put in the work. Um, so, but I, again, like I said, I think he's got the skills, uh, to win the fight. Um, it all depends on whether or not, uh, Silva comes out and can bring back, uh, his youth, you know, because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a Silva being able to come back and, and, and be able to be who he used to be for him to beat Paul. All right. Cause, cause Jake, uh, already had a fight against the UFC guy and he beat him. Uh, Woodley. Uh, Woodley. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I mean, you can't even say anything. I mean, that was a legitimate win by Jake Paul. Hate it all you want. Be angry all as you want. But numbers are coming in. And that's all that matters. Yep. Yep. Well, that's what it is. Ken Shamrock, appreciate you coming in. Uh, a legendary career. A legendary career. And you never ducked anybody. Nope. Uh, you fought all the toughest guys. You took on every challenger. Uh, you took on damage along the way. And, you know, you managed to really straddle the road between UFC and WWE and be a champion of both. And I think that's extremely impressive. Not not to, I mean, has anyone ever actually done that on this level before? I don't think so. Well, they've done it, but I was the first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is, man. Truly an honor to sit down with you. Wish you all the best. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.